webinar recording as well as the slides will be available on the OASPA website in the coming days. And when you join an OASPA webinar, you are also agreeing to the participant agreement. I will drop the link of that in the chat box below. So I will now hand over to our chair for today's session, Vincent. Vincent, over to you. Have a great session, everyone. Great, uh, Ruby, thanks a lot. Um, I see still that there are people coming in, but since we have, as always, a jam-packed program, I'm just gonna start with introductions. Um, so thank you all for attending today's OSPA webinar. Um, OSPA would like to thank its 2022 webinar series sponsors whose support enables us to make webinars available to everyone. Um, past webinars can be found on the OSPA webinar uh, website at the address that should appear on the slide. All right, this is the thank you slide. Should be another slide coming up with an, a, a web address. Um, and the link of today's recording uh, will also be found or can also be found there. And uh, we'll make sure that everybody who's registered for this webinar also gets an email with the link, um, as well as the slides of the different presenters. We're also going to put them up. So we have about 480 uh, people registered for this webinar. Uh, usually, about 50% of those who register also attend. Um, I currently see about 165 people uh, in this webinar and counting. So um, that sounds about right. So we have registrants from all over the world uh, and from 54 countries. Uh, North America and UK uh, usually make up health, but for this webinar, we also have a lot of registrations from Brazil, Vietnam, South Africa, India, Netherlands, Germany, France, and Indonesia. And registrants come from approximately 360 different organizations. Um, over half of the registrants are from an academic library, with many others from publishing organizations, academic research, nonprofits and charities, governmental and non governmental organizations, amongst others. Um, my name is Vincent van Gerven Uy, and I am co director of Scholar and Queer Led Open Access Press Functum Books. And today's OSPA webinar is titled, as Ruby already said, Shadow Libraries and Access to Knowledge, Origins, Policies, Legality, and Accessibility. Large segments of the scholarly literature, both from backlist catalogs and new publications, continue to be only accessible behind paywall infrastructures. And this poses a challenge to those scholars not affiliated with well-funded research institutions, in particular in the Global South, exacerbating extant inequities. At the same time, the often cumbersome user interfaces of payable protected platforms continue to prevent efficient usage by research who do happen to have access to these materials via their institutions. But knowledge wants to be free and has indeed found a way to be free. An ecosystem of so-called shadow libraries, such as SciHub, LibGen, and ARG has evolved, developing different strategies with different levels of human curation human librarianship indeed, to make closed content accessible to a wide audience. The fact that many closed and mixed model um, uh, uh, publishers opened their catalogs during the COVID-19 pandemic and recently during the Ukraine war shows that there is a clear awareness within the industry that full and public access to knowledge indeed saves lives and is felt under the right social incentives even to be a moral imperative. Yet. Contrary to, for example, the music and movie industries, the academic publishing industry has been unable to formulate a platform solution that would provide an alternative to said shadow library infrastructures. In this OSPA webinar, uh, we intend to address the origins and architecture of these forms of widely used online repositories, their position in relation to open access policies, legal aspects in terms of copyright and fair use, and what they can teach us in terms of accessibility and librarianship. We have four presenters and a respondent present with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce them shortly, and uh, uh, you will be able to find longer biographies on uh, the OSBA website. So we have in order of a presentation, uh, Balaj Baudot from the University of Amsterdam, Martin Paul Eve from Birkbeck, Arul George Scaria from the National Law University in Delhi, 
Marcel Mars from Memory of the World and Pirate Care, and our respondent Virginia Crisp from King's College London and Piracy Lab. Welcome to you all. Um, I think that the biographies should appear in the chat also uh, as uh, we run through the presentations as well as their Twitter handles. Um, each speaker will talk for six minutes after which we will open to a general discussion. And please use the Q&A box. So the Q&A box, not the chat box for your questions. And during the uh, open discussion, I will uh, try to moderate these uh, questions posed there um, as uh, fluently and swiftly as I possibly can. Um, so without any further ado, I uh, give the mic to our first presenter today, Balaj Bodo from the University of Amsterdam. You're on mute. Uh, and yes. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I was asked to actually um, uh, give you a brief introduction to uh, the history of uh, shadow libraries, uh, which, will I, which I will uh, try to do uh, based, on, uh, based on actually this publication, uh, Shadow Libraries, Access to Knowledge uh, in Global Higher Education, uh, which is a collection of uh, research projects uh, um, uh, organized uh, by Joe Karaganis, who edited this book, uh, who looks into uh, how uh, in various countries across the world, from South Africa to Uruguay, people access uh, scholarly uh, works um, uh, in research and education. And in that uh, book, I wrote a brief chapter on the history of uh, library genesis, uh, because I was fascinated by the fact that uh, on the one hand, it seems to be that uh, building digital libraries was the first killer application on the internet. Uh, Project Gutenberg uh, already started in 1971, so this was really the, one of the first uh, activities on ARPANET. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it declined at least uh, uh, um, the, the dream of the universal library very fast. Uh, and this decline was due to the fact that uh, even if uh, there was any uncertainty around the legality of like digitizing works in copyright and then putting them up uh, on the internet. Uh, this uh, uncertainty very quickly uh, went away uh, through a number of lawsuits uh, and uh, legal conflicts around what Hadith Trust or Google Books have done in terms of digitization, which rendered many of the, um, uh, the, the legal digital libraries incomplete because they could only uh, publish uh, uh, out of copyright works and also pushed uh, the idea of the universal library underground. Um, and there are a, a number of these shadow libraries which try to give access to uh, works which are in copyright uh, to uh, to people who need access to that. Uh, some of them are very local in terms of collections. Uh, the Silent Library Project only deals with Hungarian content. The uh, Polish Chomikui site uh, uh, deals in um, uh, or serves uh, Polish audiences. Uh, there are some uh, thematic niches like the art or monoscope um, uh, collections. Uh, many of these uh, 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 shadow library activities are platform specific. Uh, on Twitter, there's a hashtag called I can have PDF. On Reddit, there is a scholar subreddit uh, which uh, shares or gives access to, um, uh, to, uh, to otherwise inaccessible content. There are still IRC bots, which you can actually ask uh, uh, to deliver um, uh, ebooks. There are dedicated torrent trackers that are um, uh, like what Marcel will um, uh, demonstrate. Um, uh, plugins on, uh, on, on Calibre, uh, which facilitate the sharing uh, of um, the clandestine sharing of books. Uh, but the two biggest uh, 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 platforms of having access to scholarly literature uh, are actually both very out in the public, uh, very vocal and also very large. Library Genesis is a book collection. Uh, today, I've checked, it has uh, more than 3.2 million records. These are not 2.3 million different books, but close to it. Um, and SciHub gives access to eight, uh, 88 million uh, journal articles. And these both uh, operate uh, outside of uh, the boundaries of uh, legality. So they are both copyright infringing. 
um, and blatantly uh, so. Uh, the other interesting uh, characteristic of them is that they are both operate from or around uh, Russia or uh, post-Soviet um, uh, territories. Uh, Alexandra is a, a, a Kazakh scholar uh, and library genesis is uh, predominantly a Russian speaking project. Uh, and the, the question that I would like to uh, 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 like lead you through a little bit today is why that is, why are these, uh, these projects are so Russian or very much rooted in, uh, in Russian speaking community. Um, and there are a number of reasons. So I would like to argue uh, that uh, uh, both library genesis and Sci-Hub are actually a product of a number of overlapping uh, histories or developments or, uh, or political, social, cultural uh, uh, contexts, which uh, created a very unique and also very specific environment in which these services could be born and also uh, can uh, uh, survive. So um, uh, the, uh, the first one is the, the copyright tradition of uh, both the Soviet Union and Russia. Um, the Soviet IP regime uh, has uh, very only very it was a very lax uh, regime and it uh, prioritized knowledge imports so it didn't recognize uh, the copyrights of foreign authors and it also didn't put constraints on uh, translation so there was a very permissive copyright regime and there was also a very strange copyright history where the uh, Soviet and then later the Russian post-Soviet uh, IP protection frameworks remained very weakly aligned with the global uh, uh, regimes, and you can see that uh, uh, with its uh, announcement a couple of weeks ago, when Russia, under the sanctions, uh, announced that it's gonna uh, will not respect any foreign copyright or IP IP rights. This is coupled with a very lax and very selective domestic enforcement uh, mechanism. So even if there are formal uh, IP rules, uh, their enforcement is uh, not guaranteed. Second, there is a very strong cultural tradition of Russia being a reading nation. Uh, they have seen themselves, they are seeing themselves as a, uh, as a nation very proud of their uh, literary uh, traditions. Uh, and this is coupled with a very strong norms on uh, commonality and knowledge sharing, uh, which uh, developed in the Soviet era, both in opposition to censorship, but also in opposition to the economic uh, hardships, which prevented uh, 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 the existence of a healthy uh, literary market. Uh, third, there is a very strong political legacy that, that we have to be aware of, and this is the Samizdat culture. Uh, in face of the uh, Soviet censorship and political opposition, a vast uh, and a very deeply rooted uh, set of skills and practices emerged, which were there to actually bypass political censorship and ensure both the production and the circulation of texts in face of uh, in a hostile in environment, uh, and that like survived uh, in the post-Soviet era as well. Um, take this as the, like the general environment and then put uh, individual uh, histories in there, individual histories in terms of institutional stories and then uh, personal stories. When it comes to the institutional histories, what we see is that there are a number of highly influential Soviet, Russian higher education and research institutions with, which were, uh, uh, in a strange position. On the one hand, they had very early access to computers. Second, they, were, they didn't have access to knowledge. Uh, and this uh, uh, led to a solution where many people in these uh, uh, institutions uh, very quickly uh, at the turn of the 90s uh, developed large scale text archives where they digitized everything that they had uh, access to or they wanted to have access to. And they started to build this immense uh, text collections, textbooks, uh, 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 books, uh, uh, journals, uh, which they scanned because they could, because they had the scanners and they started to circulate this through CDs and DVDs and later internet. Interestingly, the very first English language pirate library, shadow library, Gigapedia, which has been shut down um, in the early 2000s, grew out of this Russian collection uh, by taking the English language uh, works and putting them uh, uh, online uh, visible for the uh, English speaking community. Uh, so that's the institutional history. And there is also a personal history where uh, uh, librarians like Mas uh, Maxim Moshkov, who started up uh, library.ru, um, um, uh, 
acted as moral entrepreneurs in the early 1990s and uh, 2000s, and uh, through their actions and through their uh, uh, public uh, uh, activities, normalized uh, collecting, digitizing uh, uh, works of uh, uh, Russian works uh, and building uh, digital libraries um, uh, for the masses. And, uh, some of that was made possible by the fact that, unlike in the West, in the Russia, there was no uh, like uh, several decades long encroachment of public interest and public domain by pri private corporate interests. So there was a large scale support, social support for such uh, public librarianship or digital librarianship. Um, and lastly, um, there was a very strange uh, technological uh, uh, movement or window of opportunity here, uh, meaning that uh, uh, in uh, Soviet and the late Soviet years and in Russia, there were no photocopy machines. So unlike in other uh, uh, countries where photocopy machines were available in the 80s already or in the early 90s, the print culture had to just skip this step. Uh, in India, uh, the pirate culture is uh, in photocopies still. Uh, in, in many uh, domains, but I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Aru will uh, have some uh, words on that. Uh, the Russians didn't have uh, this um, uh, uh, chance to uh, uh, build a pirate culture on photocopies. They went straight to digital, uh, and uh, and uh, that was a really nice uh, window of opportunity. Um, so this is the history, and what maintains these systems uh, is a little bit different because uh, the present is uh, maintained by this very strange alliance between a center and the periphery or many centers and many peripheries uh, because uh, uh, academics at the center uh, are the ones who have access to content right uh, their cooperation is required for many of these uh, uh, services to operate and be fed with new content uh, but at the periphery, uh, at the uh, at the uh, non-enforcement environments, uh, far away jurisdictions, and safe server uh, hosting companies, there is the freedom uh, which uh, is a, a allows the hosting of these services. So, uh, I think there here the, the solidarity between center and periphery plays out really nice, and this is the long-term uh, 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 background which uh, helps uh, these. Uh, uh, services to survive. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Balaj. Um, we'll go continue with uh, Martin Paul Eve from Berkshire. Hey, Martin. Hey, Vincent. Thank you very much. Um, are my slides up? Is that all looking okay? Slides are good. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the questions that I feel are brought to light by the existence of shadow libraries. I'm going to talk a little bit about the comparison to other cultures of piracy. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, formal institutional structures and the challenges faced within um, universities with the conflicting demands for access and information security and where those sit in relation to one another. The first thing I wanted to do actually was to go back to something that Vincent mentioned at the very start in his introduction, which was the point that shadow libraries justify themselves on the basis of education being somehow different to other forms of cultural production. Um, if you look at the recent initiative um, on Reddit, which was a, an effort to uh, archive the content of library genesis in a distributed torrent form, um, the user who coordinated that shrine said um, this initiative fulfills United Nations or UNESCO World Development Goals that mandate the removal of restrictions on access to science. Um, he also said that limiting and delaying humanity's access to science isn't a business, it's a crime, one with an untold number of victims and preventable deaths. So one of the most interesting first points for me here is that um, shadow libraries justify their existence on quite an old premise in our societies that education fulfills a different function to say the production of music for entertainment or films um, or other cultural forms that are, are consumed. And in a sense, this legitimation is interesting because it's playing into a very long tradition of exemption. 
and thinking about um, exemptions, say, in copyright law for education, fair use and fair dealings for the purpose of criticism or, or comment and so on. And so while they don't succeed at the moment in that legitimation claim because they're, they're so um, railroaded down by, by those whose copyright interests are violated by what they're doing, I think it's worth noting the justificatory premise on which these, these libraries exist in the first place and to think, is education different? Does it ex deserve that exemption? The next thing that comes to mind for me, though, in the rhetorics that circle around shadow libraries is a certain disciplinary hierarchy that emerges that I think can be quite problematic. So going back to that quote that I just gave you, limiting and delaying humanity's access to science isn't a business, it's a crime one with an untold number of victims and preventable deaths. In that hierarchy that's established there, science and life-saving biomedical technologies are inscribed at the top of a pyramid um, of importance with other subjects like social scientific research or humanistic research and history far lower down the pecking order. I mean, I, I work in a literature department and I'm afraid to say, you know, much as I think my, my discipline is important, nobody actually dies if um, they can't read my work or get access to our publications. Um, but this hierarchy of justification that emerges in the shadow library space often privileges um, those claims to scientific, natural scientific, biomedical research in, in again, those legitimation moves. Um, and for me, there's a question there about what we value in terms of knowledge, whether access to knowledge across all disciplines is equally important. And, you know, I can see why it's the move that a shadow library would make in its justification. Do I agree with the underlying implications of it is a very different um, intellectual matter. I also want to think a bit about who runs this, who participates and what um, shadow libraries look like. So I spent the past few years researching a different underground piracy culture called the Wares Scene. Uh, which is a highly organized professionalized space uh, where pirates work to um, install operatives at various points in the supply chain so for instance people who work at disc manufacturing plants at movie production studios even people who receive screener copies of films for their oscar judging um, duties have been found to be involved um, and they've built this entire um, space where pirate groups race to release material they race to um, beat each other in this game of prestige um, it's highly hierarchized it's incredibly competitive it's not a socialistic undertaking in any way it has many of the characteristics of contemporary capital built into what's going on but it also strikes me that the, the reason that people participate in those cultures is very different to the reasons that people work with shadow libraries Shadow libraries have a user base of users who are disenfranchised from access to research material, um, but they also have um, a set of extremely devoted uh, participants who work to upload material to shadow libraries to share research knowledge. And again, this comes back to the reasons why people want these to exist and the fact that um, from what I know and, and reading forum posts, say, at the Miners Hut Forum on, on Library Genesis, you can see that people who, who work in this space profess to have a desire to share knowledge for the greater good of humanity, even against copyright law. And I just wanted to close what I was going to say by posing some of the problems that this, this generates for institutions. So the, the most strident criticisms of Sci-Hub, Library Genesis and so forth is that they use uh, stolen credentials from academic libraries in order to populate their database and to run the automatic harvester that, that pulls in articles into what they're running. Now whether that's true or not is subject to debate. Um, there are obviously very strong vested corporate interests who would like to accuse Sci-Hub of being an instrument of the Russian state, for instance. Um, that's a very potent political claim to make right now and obviously makes it hard to justify some of those activities. But the people who make those claims are obviously the ones who are being potentially hurt by the copyright violation in the first place, so that both sides have a, a justificatory angle here. 
But I think one of the challenges we face, say, at my institution is that if credentials are being fished or used for unauthorized purposes, we have single sign-on systems that mean that actually uh, records like student data that are subject to stringent GDPR provisions would also be accessible via those routes. And the interconnectedness of university IT systems means that actually um, there's some danger in this credential sharing approach that could be problematic. I also just wanted to think about the size of these libraries and what they do for information sharing. So 3.5 million um, books sounds enormous and it is one of the biggest openly accessible um, archives of books anywhere in the world. But if you think about that in comparison to um, legal deposit libraries, the British Library has 13.5 million or so books at the moment. And in fact, there are 9,000 missing items at the British Library that just got lost in their hundreds upon hundreds of kilometers of stacks um, and that were never found again. So in terms of what gap shadow libraries are plugging at the moment, there is clearly a demand. Um, they wouldn't exist where they're not. Um, but on the other hand, they're not yet at the point where they can supplant and surpass the conventional library holdings of national deposit libraries in their scale and legal scope. Um, whether or not LibGen will ever get that far remains to be seen. Thank you very much. That's where I'll hand over. Great. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, we will move to our old George Scaria. Thanks, 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 Vincent. Um, it's a pity uh, that today's session, I mean, the panel is highly dominated by men, but the story which I want to share as part of my initial remarks is about a brave woman who is actually fighting a big litigation before one of the courts in India. And that, as most of you might be aware of, uh, is a Delhi High Court. And the litigation which I am referring to is a Sahib litigation. Um, I guess I have a small issue with my slides. I'll just quickly resolve. Uh, I think this works now. This looks good. It's good? Okay. Perfect. So, um, as at least most of you must be aware of, uh, in this particular case, this litigation was initiated by three major publishers, Elsevier, Wiley, and the American Chemical Society. And the major defendants in this particular case um, are one, Alexandra Elbakian um, uh, for Sahib. And then, of course, they have also made Libgen as one of the defendants, but no one has entered an appearance in the court on behalf of Libgen. And then there are also certain internet service providers who have been made as defendants because if the court wants to, or if the plaintiff wants to enforce the injunction, it also requires cooperation from the side of internet service providers. So they have also been made as defendants in this particular um, case. So. If you look at this particular litigation, you will notice that the primary argument which is being made by the plaintiffs is that the defendants are violating the copyrights in different articles as well as books. But one of the things which is very unclear from the documents submitted in the courts is that they haven't submitted the proofs of copyright ownership in all the works. All what they have done is submitting some sample works wherein, yes, they show that there is copyright which is owned by these publishers. Um, they have also specifically, the publishers have also specifically argued that the defendants are engaging in circumvention of technological protection measures, which again is something that would be an offense under the Indian copyright law. The one of the most strangest things that has happened through this particular litigation is the plaintiffs are also seeking what lawyers are now calling as dynamic injunction. And some of you might be thinking what exactly is a dynamic injunction, right? So this came to India through one of the 2019 litigations, UTV Software Communication versus 1337X.to, which was relating to piracy of movies. But now in this litigation, they are saying that, yes, we should also extend this principle of dynamic injunction to 
these kinds of literary works. So what is dynamic injunction? In the case of a dynamic injunction, if a particular court is characterizing a particular website as a rogue website, then the plaintiff won't have to go back to the judges to have any new domains blocked for sharing the same materials. They can get the injunction order extended just with a request to the court's deputy register. And that's actually a pity because that means for the subsequent applications, there wouldn't be an extensive judicial scrutiny. All what the court's deputy registrar will have to do is they just have to see whether it's the same materials that are getting shared. And then the injunction would be getting extended there also. So the consequences, as you can imagine, are very, very high in this particular scenario. So what are the arguments made by the defense? So the most important argument made by the SIGAP legal team is that under the Indian copyright law, we have what is generally known as a fair dealing exception. And the exception is very categorically saying the following act shall not constitute an infringement of copyright, namely a fair dealing with any work not being a computer program for the purpose of private or personal use, including research. And according to the lawyers of Sai Hub, they argue that this includes not just the end users, but also people who are facilitating researchers to exercise this legitimate right under the copyright law. So as you can imagine, for most of the users, if you do not have a facilitator like Sai Hub or Libgen, they wouldn't be able to access these materials, which in effect means whatever right they have as a user under copyright law will be completely meaningless if they do not have a facilitator. So this litigation is very important and the hearings are continuing. So today there was, um, we were supposed to have a hearing, but that also got adjourned. So the court has said the next hearing will be tomorrow. We do not know whether the hearing will be happening, but the consequences, as you can imagine, are very high. If the court is going to issue a dynamic injunction, then it is definitely going to derail research in India because even the most liberally funded institutions in India cannot afford to have access to most of the works which the researchers would require. So if Saiga and Libgen goes down and if particularly through a dynamic injunction, the consequences are very high. And I truly hope that the court which is considering this matter will take into consideration the public interest aspect before they take a final call on this. So with this, I guess I will end my introductory remarks, but I would be very interested to hear your comments on this litigation and I would be really happy to answer any questions that you might have with respect to this extremely important litigation and an extremely important fight, which Ms. Al Alexandria Albakini is making for the global so Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Aru. I already see uh, some discussion in the chat going on. Uh, also already some questions coming in. So this is really nice. Um, we will move to our last uh, presenter uh, before uh, moving to our respondent, Virginia Crisp. Uh, Marcel, can you hear me? And we can see your slides. We cannot hear you yet. Here I am, I'm sorry, I, yep. I did the share screen and then my Zoom just uh, kind of we, disappeared. And okay. I say I'm not a master of Zoom uh, software and not plan to become one. Um, so yeah, um, here I am, I can start. Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. Mm. So Memory of the World is the project I will talk about. Uh, and I run with uh, with few others. So Memory of the World is in the in in its tenth year of existence. It was launched in 2012 in Ljubljana at the Hype Festival, and it was rather a conceptual take. Instead of running another instance of curated uh, new media art festival, um, <clears throat> we claim that a Hype Festival is a public library that the space we inhabited is the space of a public library and that the program we run for the days of the festival is the program of a public library. And we were able to convince people that 
we are all part of a public library, mostly thanks to the gesture of people behind library genesis, because they allowed us and anyone else with a good bandwidth to download at a time a million books they, they, they had in their, their repository. So after a few weeks or rather months uh, before the, the festival, we were able to say at the launch, here they are, a million books in a box in, at, at a server sitting with us in, in, in the same room. That made us comfortable to run a program raising all of the problems we still discuss today. Also, we felt that imaginary horizon is a very important part of the change we wanted to see. And we believe that when it comes to digital networks media, a good demonstration showing what is possible on your screen says a lot, says a lot about what is possible in the world away from our keyboards. Showing what is possible was the initial reason for Let's Share Book software to be developed. And that's the software which is behind Memory of the World and which I mostly uh, uh, developed and, 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 and wrote. And what we wanted to support and articulate with that demonstration was the idea of a public library where a public library is a free access to books for every member of society. It's a library catalog and a librarian. And with books ready to be shared, meticulously cataloged, everyone is a librarian. And when everyone is a librarian, library is everywhere. <clears throat> so that was just like our a rather kind of poetic and uh, deliberately naive approach to all of that. And in 10 years, Memory of the World went from just a demonstration on a screen of what is possible at that day into the proper infrastructure in which a dozen of librarians uh, run a library of more than uh, 150,000 books at the moment. Um, so here's just like the latest, uh, latest titles. Uh, I don't know, things like this. Uh, something which you would just expect from a good catalog uh, uh, website. And here are the list of the amateur librarians. It doesn't uh, fit on this <laughs> on this screen now. There is more. Anyway, um, so every single book here on on this website on Memory of the World is there because a human, an amateur librarian, have chosen a book and took care of its metadata cataloging, and then joining a network of other amateur librarians who care and share their books, and who also share the vision that that's the public library we actually know of from a, a, a long period of time, and which got that vision and a proper infrastructure and all of these institutions, which got in trouble when actually, uh, when the, the time and the age of digital uh, network came. So if you would talk to anyone decades before uh, internet, what would be possible in the future, everyone would, just, would say it's just public libraries must blossom in that age. But what actually happened, and it's getting worse and worse in last 10 years of our existence, uh, uh, it actually it, it got worse, is that these uh, 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 institutions are uh, very much in trouble whenever they want to do what they promised. And when we as a society allow them to, to, to that's how, how we actually make that happen. So, so when we want to found institution, usually that institution will share the mission and vision with us. And then we say, yes, we want these, these institutions. We share the vision. We share the idea how society should be. And this is why we'll care about it. Uh, uh, institution and what actually happened was that uh, uh, that that our beloved institutions, uh, with all of its problems, because there is no institution which could be run without uh, problems, without being sensitive enough, with without the idea uh, uh, how to actually serve the society. But in this case, uh, even when they want, even when when they uh, 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 try to do these uh, uh, things, they, they get in trouble. So that's why we see our project as something which is accompanying, which is 
coming from a shadow to support that idea and to support of these all of these institutions and what we would be the happiest if um if we will just be like redundant when the institutions will actually take care of that and uh, you mentioned before i was also part of the pirate care project and that's the project which lists and uh, uh um and, and, and support and kind of do the research in which the disobedience uh, and practices with the disobedience uh, are actually in existence today. And I am just like, I, I'm running out of time so now. So what I'm trying to say is that the vision of a society we want got in much of a trouble. And then people who actually help get there are also getting in trouble. And they are not only getting in trouble because that's hard, but they are getting in trouble because the institutions are running our society are not letting them do that. So we have a complete schizophrenia where our heroes are in illegal status, where our heroes who go with the boats to save some lives in the Mediterranean Sea are actually getting in prison. When people who share books in that sense are also supposed to end up uh, in, a, uh, in a prison or people who would provide a medical care, who would provide a support for people who are not recognized as regular people will also get in trouble. So that's why we are here. And I think that the, 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 the problem is very much uh, 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 clear when it comes to the public libraries and where it, where, where it comes to what we are talking today. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm done, thank you. Thanks, thanks Marcel. Um, all right, so we uh, uh, had a respondent. Marcel, you're still on, so maybe you can mute. Yep, great, thanks. Uh, Virginia, joining us from London, hello. Thank you, well, I'm, I'm actually masquerading as being in London, I'm Cambridge, but uh, right. close enough, <laughs> I'm still in the UK. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I'm. I'm very honoured to be a respondent to, to so many interesting thoughts. Um, I only have a few minutes, though, and I don't want to go on too long because um, there's bound to be lots of really fascinating questions. I have a couple of reflections. Inevitably, I'm going to miss an awful lot of very fascinating things that were raised. Um, one of the first things I actually want to pick up on is, is from the, the overall blurb and Vincent's original introduction about sort of academic publishers being unable to provide a legal solution um, in, in the face of these kind of shadow libraries. And I have a couple of reflections about that because um, there were lots of claims about the movie industry being incapable of um, providing legal solutions in the face of piracy after the music industry had apparently um, completely failed to respond, um, and we're talking sort of late 90s, early 2000s here. Um, but actually, I would I would ask us to think about a couple of different things. First of all, do we want do we want a legal solution? Um, do we want to maybe somewhat completely rethink our entire neoliberal understanding of how we commercialize knowledge and and how we sell that? Um, and also think about how certainly I as an academic and, and there are obviously other academics here are also very much um, embroiled in a, an overall project of selling knowledge internationally. And it's not just the, the scholarship that, that gets printed, it's also um, the um, outrageous cost of higher education across the globe, which creates so many of the inequities that we've been talking about today. Having said that, linking back to what um, Marcel was just talking about, uh, a sort of about um, when will we become redundant, when will we be replaced, also brings us back to maybe uh, a less pessimistic idea of just rejecting neoliberalism without a solution, but thinking about what, what are these libraries that we want to return to. Um, the concept of a public library, certainly in the UK, and I'm aware across the, the globe, has sort of diminished so much in the face of, of all sorts of factors. Um, but there is, um, going back to what Ballas was saying, also, you know, evidence in the original sort of birth of the internet, a sense that really what we really wanted was some universal access to knowledge, to books, to culture in so many ways. I'd like to pick up then uh, also on something Bella said about this collaboration between the centre and the periphery. Uh, and I'd just like to throw in a thought here in relation to the fact that 
a lot of this is to do with um, scholars feeling the need to share their own work because there is a again a neoliberal need for academics um, certainly in an awful lot of contexts to sell themselves and sell their work um, and we're very well aware of the fact that we don't get paid particularly for publishing things but we are again sort of caught up in a complex system whereby um, our reputation is our currency and how many um, books we have sold, but also how many people are reading our work becomes our currency. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if academics don't consider how much um, their work is downloaded from shadow libraries in the same way that uh, Netflix used to claim that their shows were downloaded or major Hollywood studios used to claim that they were illegally uh, obtained and therefore use that as, as markers of prestige. Um, but also certainly anecdotally, I know that uh, most of my academic colleagues are the people seeding their work on these kind of channels. And, and there's an element of self-promotion going on there. Um, so I'd just like us to think a little bit more about the um, the, the less benevolent ways that we might be um, sharing knowledge in that context. Um, and I feel that I kind of uh, run out of time a little bit, but um, also I think it just, you know, it's these shadow libraries are, are a fantastic resource, again, for people who know how to use them and have access to technology, but also have access to um, stable internet connections, access to, um, uh, reliable electricity and all of these kind of things. And I think um, there is a danger within certain shadow libraries of a, a sort of reproduction of certain hierarchies and um, knowledges being the most important, kind of going back to what Martin was saying um, and kind of reproducing an idea that certain forms of um, scholarship um, but also that the things that are available in these shadow libraries are also, um, in a way, I wouldn't be surprised, sort of drawing on some of um, Ballas's previous work, aren't also mimicking what's more um, commonly available um, in more official channels. So those are my rather convoluted and off the top of my head thoughts, but uh, thank you all again for such um, interesting and thought-provoking um, presentations. Thank you so much, Virginia, for this um, for this first response. I don't know if any of our uh, panelists would like to respond in turn, um, or otherwise, whether you would like me to move. I mean, there are already a large bunch of questions and discussions in the chat. So, all right. Well, why don't I? I mean, I just I just read this uh, in the chat. Uh, it's from uh, Willa Libert Tavernier. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, and I just want to take a snippet of that and then segue into one of the first questions in the in the in the Q and A board. Um, so Willa writes, "It's very evident that these issues, like so many others, uh, are uh, uh, about power. Who has the power to make laws in closing knowledge within specific countries?" Um, and I think that this is um, this this directly uh, points to the uh, to the issues, some of the issues that are rule. Um, mentioned in his uh, uh, in his presentation uh, that that ideas of fair usage may vary widely uh, depending on the jurisdiction in which they uh, yeah, in which they are oper operative um, and I would like to segue from that to um, and also maybe because like in the end uh, OSPA deals uh, with you know with open access publishing as, as Virginia also indicated um, maybe for the first question, I would like to go to one of Katrina McCollum here, um, which says the following, uh, open access uh, CCBY uh, could in principle solve the problems associated with the growth of shadow libraries, including expensive litigation, if there's also an open infrastructure to support access and discovery. Do the panelists think that open access is a solution? And how can we ensure that the relevant infrastructure is also open? Or will there always be a need for the sci hops of the world? I think this is a really nice open question. Um, any of the panelists or, or Virginia, feel free also to respond and to uh, 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 discuss uh, uh, 
uh, in response to this question. Can I kick us off? Um, yeah. There's a really interesting tension here between thinking about infrastructural provision being open versus the content itself being open. Open access addresses that latter matter. And if we had universal open access, um, you know, a large part of why Sci-Hub had to exist would, would disappear overnight. And that would be, you know, a huge gain. On the other hand, it's also worth looking at how Sci-Hub actually works and what it gives you. It gives you a single search box where you can just put in an identifier and you immediately just chuck the article back without any faffing about, without going through institutional login systems, without having to, you know, you can even programmatically query it and get the file delivered directly to you if you want to do computational work on, on this stuff. And there's no incentive for many large commercial players to develop something that works simply as well as that, even if the content was open. What they want to do is to capture intermediate data about how people are reading and, and publishing. Um, they have incentives to ensure that you go via their advertising portals, see what their other products are and so on. And it just strikes me that there are always people who see, see a problem and just build something to try to fix it. And Sci-Hub has done that in multiple ways, not just on the content angle, but also just on the ease of use and the facility with which it makes research available. Thank you. Uh, I think any of the other panelists would like to address this? So, yeah, uh, Vincent, I think open access is certainly the long-term sustainable solution for addressing the crisis. But I think we are far away from that ideal world, right? And one of the other things which we should also Keep in mind is that yes, in most of the cases, open access would be applicable for prospective works, the right works which we are going to create in future. What about the vast repertoire of works that are already in existence, right? For that, this challenge is going to continue. And unfortunately, we are living in a world wherein we have an extremely broad, extremely long copyright term, right? Take any country that the broadness in terms of breadth as well as in terms of length copyright is at a very undesirable level. So I do not consider the open access movement as a complete substitute, but of course, going forward, yes, we should definitely be focusing heavily on that because that's definitely going to be a long-term sustainable solution, but at least for addressing the works that are already in existence, which are under the copyright uh, surveillance, I think we need to still rely on the shadow libraries or unless the publishers are going to change their business model radically. Thank you. Um, maybe a rule following. Oh, sorry, Marcel, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that um, without changing the, the principles and why we would go into more open and without the principles taking in account why we actually ended up here, I don't think that that would be really like that would ever like end up in what we wanted, no? Because it is about the politics. It is about the power. And it is about how long some of the monopolies will go on. And the monopolies have a lot of resources. And if we don't have a clear principles, then these monopolies would invest into at least buying a time in order to appropriate what they can appropriate. So in that sense, uh, the, what actually these uh, approaches could make is that the evaluation, the valuation of knowledge will, will start to happen. So what we will actually have is like two camps and that's what happened in Creative Commons when it came to culture is that you would have something also very much spread in a culture which is kind of cheap, which is not good. And then if you say, oh, I have a music which is Creative Commons and more, many people who wouldn't care about it would say like, I don't wanna be uh, 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 like uh, painted by that because it's already like bad. People don't want to listen to that. So in that sense, what I feel is that when you don't have a clear vision, what are the politics? Why we are doing that? We will end up in a in 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 that sense in a in a new map where the the, the things 
without like a market value would be pushed in a camp which no one cares about. And then there will be a lot of politics and a lot of struggle around the things which we care about, which public cares about, but actually we are shut down or we are silenced because what, what is actually happening is, oh, we have the open, uh, open access and we have this, and, and then we are not talking about time. We are not talking about how to address the climate change, how to address inequality in the world, how to address the maybe like a nuclear war, which are like all of these things. And these are all very much connected. And this is about the politics. So in that sense, yes, it could help, it could help, but without the strong will, power, and the struggle, we will never like, we will never get there. And, and, and maybe we are in, uh, uh, naive in memory of the world when we want to do like a poetic vision why we should go there, but we are absolutely not naive when it comes to what will happen if we just uh, say we are happy with open access. This is what will provide us a better world. I don't think so in, 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 the, in, the, in the way how it is uh, implemented now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, I'm going to, because questions keep coming in and, and I always like to make nice segues, but it's not always possible. Um, so I, I, there's a question here for Aru that, that partially touches upon some of the, the things that you've been saying. So it's from Tobias, Tobias Steiner. Uh, Aru, is there any actual probability that Sci-Hub will become inaccessible if the Indian case is won? Or will it mainly be stating the fact that, it's, uh, that it is Ill illegal? So what are the risks for the uh, Indian research community? So when this litigation got initiated, I think most of the people thought, okay, I mean, what will happen even if the court is going to declare this as illegal? But when I look at this litigation today, I must say that I'm feeling scared. And I'm saying that for two reasons. One, the kind of remedy which they are seeking, the dynamic injection is certainly a dangerous tool because as I tried to explain during my initial remarks, once they get an order in favor of them, all what they need to do is go back to the court register who is generally an administrative officer, show her or him that the contents in XYZ sites are exactly the same, so please extend the injunction, which means it's as, or it will become far easier for them to extend the injunction to the new um, domains. The second issue is in one of the recently notified guidelines, the government has made it very clear that there will also be, um, or the VPNs, the VPNs will also have to store data relating to the users, which in effect means um, once this gets banned in India, um, the access situation would be very, very different from what it might be today. I'm not sure how many of the researchers in India will be uh, technologically as well as uh, legally equipped to handle that kind of a crisis. So this is not a mere theoretical fight or a legal mere battle on illegality of something, but it's gonna cut the lifeline of research in India. At least that's my view on this. All right, thank you. Um... Building on on this uh, this question of legality, there is a there's a question from Sibyl von Eck. Um, some panelists and the commentator made reference to whether a legal alternative would be needed. However, what is legal continuously changes as well. Some practices were legal and then were made illegal, mainly because of profit making considerations. And the question here is, uh, and I think, I mean, actually what we're talking about currently in India is precisely one of these conditions in which things, you know, were legal in the past, but, you know, new presidents maybe said turning them illegal. Um, in what sense should what is currently legal or not legal be an anchor point for considerations on how things should be? Uh, and I think that we know Marcel's position uh, on this question, but maybe uh, uh, Balash or, or Virginia or, uh, would like to, uh, like to address this question. I'm, I'm happy. I, I'm, uh, I'm actually at the, at the, at the Information Law Research Institute uh, as a social scientist. Uh, and I came here because um, one of my, uh, my missions was to try to, uh, uh, to, to explain to uh, copyright uh, scholars and copyright legal uh, uh, lawyers that some of the questions that they ever asked to actually deal with or, or assess are not legal questions. Um, and, uh, and you can see uh, that being manifested uh, in like the very different 
uh, ways how different library private pirates in the domain are actually giving or not giving their face to uh, blatant copyright infringing acts. Um, and, um, and in that sense, uh, what uh, Alexandra Avakian does is like standing and like uh, uh, giving her face, um, uh, or, or I don't know, Marcel, if I can point out what you, but, but, uh, uh, but Alexandra certainly uh, uh, like being a very vocal uh, public face of a blatant copyright infringing uh, service is uh, something uh, which sends the message that I don't care about the legality, this is not a question that should be decided uh, upon legal grounds or within the legal discourse. This is a political question, as Marcel said, uh, and uh, it requires political solutions. Uh, uh, but the question uh, then is like, uh, there is no political uh, uh, real, but also I don't see political uh, opportunities to actually uh, uh, undo or change the legal uh, environment. So what uh, what we're going to be looking at is a, a continuous and, and permanent attention uh, tension here, uh, which which will not be resolved in any any meaningful manner in any meaningful uh, temporal horizon. Uh, uh, there is no uh, there is no solution to this. Uh, so the question for me in the in this sense is like how we uh, uh, continue to live uh, under such conditions and what happens uh, when there are uh, no public faces uh, 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 for this cause, uh, when there are, where, where all these uh, uh, very visible figures just somehow disappear or go to jail or get too old or uh, get bored with, uh, with the sacrificing their lives for, uh, for, for something. Uh, that, that's the very something for me. Can I respond yes. as well? Go yeah, ahead. I mean, I think um, in my in my brief comments, one of the things I did was something that annoys me a lot is I kind of commercial, um, I conflated commercial and legal as to a certain amount in my head. Um, I I personally think that it, it, it often we kind of think when we're thinking about legal alternatives that therefore there should be a market answer to this, and I would very much reject the idea that that is the only or obvious way of of responding um and also i think um the the, the kind of problem for me about the the situation is how we balance the the purported uh sort of uh basis for copyright that is sort of enabling the creation of artistic works in, in whatever form that might be from academic writing to computer games um and how we with with you know access to materials and access to culture and access to knowledge etc so i but i would also question that the kind of the current models we have for remunerating artists are, are also quite problematic and they're problematic and they're kind of and this was slightly raised by someone in the chat in terms of like the the author or the individual musician struggling to to get by and the the figures for for the average salary of of those kind of individuals is, is really problematic but then also there's a problem in the academic sector as well which i was kind of hinting at in terms of if you're a tenured professor you have a secure job but then you essentially give away your writing for a, so so little that it's almost free and so i would i would sort of say in the kind of questioning these legal the need for a legal alternative there's definitely needs for alternatives um I would, however, agree with Ballas that how practical that is and how, how one might actually manage that is really problematic. Um, but I do I do feel that there is a tendency to feel that the market is the answer and eventually the market will get there, that there's an inevitable sort of shift from piracy to legal um, alternatives. And I, I would very much reject that kind of thinking. Thanks, uh, thanks, Virginia. There is there is a um, question here that 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 um, that relates to, you know, how do we think about these commercial solutions and are are they indeed uh, is this indeed the direction in which we should at all think? Uh, there are certain uh, there were uh, there are several questions in the Q and A that that deal with this this particular point. Uh, there is one from and I'm I'm going to read them a little bit together because we have a bunch of them. Um, so there's a question by uh, Janice Pilch um, um, asking, it's like, what are the reasons that, uh, or uh, I think this is also something that Martin has addressed, what are the reasons that uh, um, 
Oh, wait, sorry, not Janice. Janine, there are coming too many questions and I'm losing track of which ones uh, I am actually referring to. Janine Kerwin, um, what, what are the reasons that a commercial publisher or larger uh, 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 publishers have not developed the infrastructure that you know allows you, just like, for example, with Netflix or with um, uh, 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 or with Spotify, to you know pay two dollars for an article uh, and just look at that thing with a click, rather than these large cumbersome payroll uh, systems that we currently have. Uh, and related to that is a question uh, that I saw a little bit earlier from Ross Mounts that deal with you know. Uh, uh, the IT security of such systems and the way that such systems are, uh, as you pointed out, connected to, uh, you know, student records, grades, uh, and so on. And so, like, is, uh, is there a relation between, you know, the unwieldiness of the systems and the type of surveillance that is basically currently going on in our universities? Maybe this is for Martin, or obviously anyone else is welcome to answer. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's quite a challenging. Um, thank you. It's quite a. The IT question is a challenging one, and you you know you could protect students and student data by simply separating out those systems so that library access is not handled by the same authentication system that you're plugging into. The challenge for a library then is that that's clearly a move designed to um, facilitate the sharing of the material into. Um, pirate archives in a way that probably most institutions would feel slightly unhappy about. I mean, to address the broader question about um, whether these, what, you know, why that infrastructure hasn't been developed, at least one of the answers is to do with competition and enforced antitrust legislation um, that basically says that, you know, if publishers all got together and offered a universal solution for this, that would somehow be anti-competitive. So even the structuring logics of the market here prohibit us from building a better world in some senses. And that, that to me is absolutely ridiculous. And we've, we've then become so enmeshed in legal logics and so far down that train that we're not seeing the bigger picture, which I think is where the previous question was really heading, which was, is copyright law fit for purpose? Is the copyright regime that was instigated in an era of print that relied on material sales to remunerate the labor of publishing actually an appropriate method for thinking about digital dissemination. And to me, that's that's the fundamental question that's interesting about legality here and commercialism is that actually the world I want is one that values publishing labor in some ways. I published a book with Punctum and you know the stuff that Vincent did working with me on that book and the other people who worked with him was labor that needed to be remunerated and valued. And I'm not saying we throw that all out, but Punctum has a business model to work for open access in what it does. Um, what we're not seeing is enough of a transition from most publishers to thinking about how they can sustain and value their labor and pay people for their labor if that's, that's what they're doing and professionalize that um, in a model that is suitable for unlimited open online dissemination. One of the... Um, uh questions here, and I think relates to, um, we probably should introduce this as well, um, uh, from, from Richard uh, Getty. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm murdering names here, I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, Virginia, uh, but I think this again, segue is also, it relates to, to what, what Martin just said. Would you advocate for replication of the Latin American Cielo model in the rest of the world? Right. So the Cielo model is uh, basically all universities publish all of their works open access. Uh, all of the research is is publicly funded and publicly available. Um, would And so this also ties in with the question is, is OA a viable uh, uh, solution, right? I think that answers the, it answers the question in relation to just academic publishing, potentially. Right. Um, I, I, I probably would advocate for that. Um, I think there are there are definitely problems though because I would see an issue in terms of who is employed and who is not employed and certainly the current structure in the UK as it is in many places is that you can't really get employed until you have published and then you might be in this sort of trap of well if you're not publicly funded then your work isn't publicly available and I can I can certainly foresee some issues but without um, yeah without going into the fact that any solution is likely to have certain 
sort of drawbacks. I would I would certainly prefer that system to to the current system under which I work under, to be honest. Great, thank you. Um, maybe there in the beginning, um, there were a few comments that dealt with the with the center and periphery, and I feel that also when we talk about Latin America and India, we are dealing with these center periphery questions. So I would like to uh, read this question here from um, Natasha Drubek Meyer, uh, which says uh, Balaj, um, I enjoyed the other perspective on open access, uh, i.e., its prehistory in Eastern Europe and how you developed the cultural facets, for example, of relabeling access as reading. Um, can you say more about your understanding of the periphery? And I think there was also a question from Katrina earlier on dealing with this periphery center issues. So would you, would you like to address that? Uh, certainly. Um, like, uh, so, so many uh, things to unpack here. So one of the things uh, that's, uh, uh, that's relevant is, of course, the language. Uh, what is the language of uh, the language composition of these resources and library genesis uh, is uh, like 3.2 million record, uh, almost 2 million is English language, uh, Russian uh, uh, less than a million. And, uh, and there are a number of, uh, of uh, languages uh, still represented, German with 160,000 documents, uh, Spanish 80,000 documents, but you see it's, 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 uh, it's declining rapidly and it, uh, we, even within the European Union, the, the many uh, different languages are uh, suddenly becoming invisible. So it means that uh, these, uh, these, though these uh, resources are framed as like the um, access infrastructure for science or for academia, they are very much concentrated on an English language or Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, scientific production. That's one center periphery question. It's like who's digitizing the Hungarian language uh, science or Croatian uh, 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 scientific literary heritage and what happens to there, how it becomes visible, how it, it's not. Uh, certainly there is another center periphery here, which is, uh, uh, which is geographic, right? Uh, can uh, Alexandra Alba can travel to uh, the West? No, she, she cannot because she's gonna be uh, uh, arrested. And that's a kind of, uh, uh, abjection, uh, her existence is uh, uh, abjected uh, from a certain uh, uh, academic center or, or, or institutional center. There is also a center periphery in terms of legal uh, regimes, how in different jurisdictions enforcement is stronger, in other jurisdictions enforcement is less of a threat. Uh, and um, and uh, so uh, there, uh, there is uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, inequality uh, in, in terms of access to justice, but also like protection from prosecution, uh, whether that's uh, uh, just or unjust uh, uh, laws uh, and perspectives here also uh, matter. Um, and, and so, so uh, in that sense, uh, I, I think all these, these, um, these like uh, uh, the, the center periphery I would uh, interpret as uh, inequalities, also what uh, Virginia is, uh, referring to that, um, um, with, with people in position of more and less uh, privilege, and these are like st stacked on top of each other. These very different uh, 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 positions uh, in different hierarchies and networks. So uh, I think, in that sense, uh, and it's super interesting to see uh, the, or compare the the fates of. Uh, Aaron Schwartz, who was in the middle, like in the in the very middle of academic hierarchies, uh, affiliated with both Harvard and MIT, and Alexandra, uh, how uh, being in the center is not a protection, and being at the periphery offers some kind of a protection. Uh, in certain cases, it's not just disadvantage, but also some kind of a, a form of power. Uh, so it's um, uh, like I, I don't want to ramble on, but I, th I find uh, these uh, power, uh, overlapping power relationships uh, fascinating and very difficult to disentangle. Thank you, Balash. Maybe um, Marcel, would you, would you like to address this? Also considering the fact that the memory of the world uh, and also your Pirate Card project has focused also in particular on Eastern European cultural production and, and the, the making that available through your, through your platform. <clears throat> Am I? Yeah. 
Okay. So yeah, I, I think that um, in, in our case, um, I think that uh, we addressed a lot of, again, imaginary, but also it, it kind of, um, uh, it connects with, with, um, with the real kind of infrastructure, legality and things like, so for example, I'll, I'll just tell you like, so there is in Eastern Europe, um, uh, European Union from like around 2005 or six, uh, went for the declarations and the full kind of uh, institutional support of the imaginary where the totalitarian, communist totalitarianism is the same like fascism and Nazism, no? And that completely fueled the alternative Holocaust denier, the like extreme right, where they basically started to be very much established in very many ways, you know, like they would publish books by ISBN, they would probably like, and then uh, as, a, as a result, for example, you would have the creation Wikipedia, which at some moment was like probably something where, which um, in, in Germany you would get in jail, you know, like just by saying that, things like that. So there are like many things which are in that sense uh, 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 interconnected. And the way how we address that was that we, Get, uh, we, we got back into like uh, digitizing a lot of, um, in that sense, suppressed knowledge, which was coming from like uh, Yugoslav humanities, mostly like communist uh, workers' rights, anti-fascism, and all of that. And that's pretty much like I guess it's kind of like very strange that we are coming back to all of these political issues, which we felt that it's over. You no, know? like abortion is back. You no, know? like Holocaust deny, uh, like deny. It's it's. There are very many things which, in that sense, are very, very much uh, uh, connected. So, in that sense, for example, copyright would also be used as a protection, for, uh, uh, like for for these like uh, fascists, basically, in their publishing, if they have to protect themselves. So, copyright became the the the, the instrument to protect. We like so it was made and it was maintained as a kind of a market instrument. But then it was also used as an instrument, which is pretty much like ideological landscape. And if you remember, there were like uh, examples where people who were harassed on YouTube, and then they would go with the copyright as their instrument to protect themselves because we don't have enough of a ground in the society where that kind of harassment will be recognized so that you basically go with that because that's the problem and you are actually uh, kind of uh, uh, advised to go with, with the copyright. So in that sense, it's, I think that it, it's a big mess. And uh, I, I think that uh, being in the middle of this, like here, seems that uh, as, 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 as uh, uh, Bodo said, is that sometimes if you're in what we call periphery, brings you some protection, not necessary, but also different tactics would, uh, should be used in, in different places. So in that sense, I think that the disobedience is, is there, there is a lack of disobedience, I would say, in the like non-periphery in the, in the Anglo-Saxon world in that sense, uh, in the world of many, many privileges, and especially in the world of academia. I, I must say that, um, this is going for too long. Like these debates in academia and like not, not, not having academics really joining uh, with their names, with their tenures and things like that. I, I think that in that sense, we are doomed and we are doomed not only for that particular issue. There are like many issues which are uh, interconnected. Uh, but at the same time, it's exciting, exciting, you know, like you, you swing from depression to like, oh, this is a, this is a great battle. This is a great struggle. And, 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 and we want to, like, we want to fight for that. You no. Know? So in that sense, uh, I'm super surprised that, that, that there is no more support, uh, by vocal leftists in academia. You know? I must say without moralizing, just, I'm surprised that there is no better support, uh, by names not just by, yeah, blah, blah. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Marcel. I think that this ties to uh, some, of, uh, some of the questions that are within the Q&A. There's one particular question that, that directly points to the point you're making at the end, why is there not more support, um, which is a question by Lisa Hinchcliffe, um, which addresses this issue of like why or how, what are the procedures by which 
uh, uh, shadow libraries or pirate libraries or gray libraries, however you want to call them, gain credibility? Uh, how, you know, how do they become a credible cause? Um, this relates in part, of course, to the, uh, 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 the claims that have been made about the, the Russian affiliations of, of uh, the current Russian affiliations of a project like Sci-Hub. Um, and I think that there is an interesting flip side to, to shadow libraries that also some of the questions I've pointed out, which is predatory publishing or what is currently called in certain circles predatory publishing, namely the practice of publishing articles uh, in journals without any form of, uh, uh, of peer review, often uh, you know, using spam email tactics uh, and by using names um, of uh, uh, my naming journals in a certain way that is very close to, uh, to actually established uh, uh, journals that have gar garnered over the years some form of academic prestige. Um, so there are these issues of prestige and recognition and credibility um, that also play in this. I'm not sure if that, you know, if that cluster of questions uh, would be inviting for anyone to address. Maybe Virginia or Aru. I could probably jump in uh, in terms of, you know, the very long history of attempting to discredit any form of piracy behavior on the basis that it's tied to terror terrorism or human trafficking, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of physical piracy. And I'm not saying these connections are not there um, in certain forms of organized crime, but there is, because those connections both exist and don't exist, it's a very easy connection to make. Uh, and it's, of course, very easy to um, uh, discredit uh, certain forms of behavior as illegal and therefore immoral so i mean i don't think there's that's particularly setting on the world the world on fire to say it but it's it's my immediate reaction again in terms of the the kind of discrediting of these kind of libraries that's not to say though that connections don't also exist that need to be considered um in you know certainly in the current context Yeah, I just wanted to add one more um, interesting fact from the Sahib litigation, which might be of relevance in the context of this discussion. So one of the arguments made by the lawyers for the publishers is that it would be in the public interest to grant an injunction in favor of them. And the main reason, which according to them, is that if people are relying on shadow libraries like Sci-Hub, there is a very high risk for public health. And the, the way they reason this is they say that many articles get retracted later. And in a shadow library, this retraction doesn't get reflected. So very interesting way of putting it, right? So I just wanted to add that, yes, these are also the kind of arguments which are being made in the context of the Sci-Hub litigation. Of course, as you can imagine, um, that doesn't have much credibility, but it is important to at least see that, yes, these kinds of interesting innovative arguments are also coming up from the side of um, the publishers in this litigation. I mean, what I, what I find interesting is that when, when it comes to, uh, uh, to shadow libraries, these arguments are, you know, very frequently made, they're linked to criminal networks or they, they lead to insecurity and so on. Um, Whereas when we look at you know certain larger commercial publishers, they employ many tactics which you know uh, recently have been captured under the term surveillance capitalism, uh, surveillance publishing. Sorry, uh, there was a Jeff Bully article recently, and I think there's also one of our question askers. There are so many questions um, that 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 pointed. Uh, I think yeah, Eric Hellman's question here about the relation between surveillance capitalism uh, as even a possible model of financing. Uh, uh, shadow libraries. I would say that surveillance capital, you know, is actually financing regular, currently regular publishing practices. And so, how do we feel about these? Uh, is it again a center periphery thing? Is that is that is that an asymmetry in which certain questionable practices of, let's say, established actors within the publishing field are are less questioned than, you know, very tentative relations between uh, or like tentative suggestions. Uh, between uh, Russia, quote unquote, and, and something like Sci-Hub? Uh, 
I mean, if I find the question of surveillance publishing kind of interesting here, right? Because it's also a question of how much data gathering happens uh, by shadow libraries. It's another, another aspect of it. Yeah, and, um, uh, I would like to reflect on that a little bit because I, I see this, uh, this, uh, these arguments in, uh, like being echoed again and again and again that it's Russia. It's, uh, you, if they are untrustworthy and I think they are really uh, uh, producing and reproducing and uh, a horrible uh, 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 cultural trope. They are based on this horrible cultural trope that somehow uh, this Eastern Eastern Empire is a threat and it's untrustworthy and anything that comes out from that uh, should be um, should be uh, should be disregarded and I think it's a, a really uh, low uh, and and unworthy discussed uh, uh, argument to even to, like even to discuss. Um, uh, uh, and there is a, 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 a question in the in the questions about like criminal criminal networks and criminal no and what I'm trying to uh, uh, suggest that uh, on the one hand uh, yeah uh, Russian semistat is a uh, or was or has been considered a, as a criminal act uh, in certain parties and copyright infringement can be a criminal uh, act. Uh, the criminal uh, criminality of a certain act tells usually a little about uh, the morality uh, of that act, especially in this context. So we should like should not confuse that. Um, uh, but also, um, uh, like uh, going back to the, the the previous question, I think uh, uh, the beauty of like library genesis is that it's open source. Uh, the, the content is downloadable, the server code is downloadable, the catalog is downloadable, so you are actually able to spin up your own mirror and just uh, uh, do something with it, right? And you can, if you want to do a surveillance capitalist funded ad uh, infested version of a free resource, then you're very welcome to, to do that. And then good luck with trying to sell that to those people who can choose between the free and original version and your ad and uh, surveillance infested uh, version. I think there have been many different uh, uh, efforts in the past to actually make money out of this free resource improving on certain aspects, searchability, maybe format, conversions, la di da di da di da uh, They didn't get very far because it's very difficult to actually uh, make money by trying to uh, turn a free and beneficial benevolent resource into something unfree and malevolent uh, without any like added value. Uh, it's not like uh, punctum books uh, trying to sell books while uh, providing free PDFs of the same books. It's, we know that Punctum Books is actually the publisher. They conducted some labor, so there is a reason for them to ask some money. But a, a random guy on the internet trying to take a free resource and make money of it, I think, especially in the academic community where ethics is like uh, a more or less a day-to-day -day consideration, these questions are not very controversial. I, I, would, I would trust my fellow academics and and, uh, and uh, scientists uh, to make the good judgments about uh, 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 about these issues. Great, thanks. Uh, Marcel, we have like a few more minutes, like two more minutes left, and I also wanna make a last point, so brief. Yeah, very brief. So I think that the surveillance in that sense is like very much in, and I think that it's a very important struggle, uh, but I think that we shouldn't get into a trap to think of that as useful i think that it's mostly misuseful so it's very much it could be used for misusing but also thinking that it helps google facebook and the others much i'm not sure about that i'm, I'm not sure that their revenues are actually becoming it, there is a threat there but thinking that they're already doing that so then if we follow that we will also be kind of like whatever, we will be able to make some revenue out of that and then things like that. I'm not sure about that. And I think that the biggest kind of trap we got into is like with uh, Cambridge Analytica, thinking that that kind of surveillance really kind of helped them do something. No, they're just like morons. They're like the worst of all kind of criminals. They didn't do any, they didn't follow up on any of these promises of like uh, artificial intelligence and things like that. They just got into the spotlight and then they continued with 
bribery with like paying people, the, you know, like they just got into the bad practices, which has nothing to do with the AI, but most of the world thinks that, oh, this is the surveillance and this is the age of artificial intelligence, machine learning, which will like, kill us. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not sure about that. And I think that, that, that there is a big trap thinking of that in that way, but that doesn't mean that the struggle against that, the struggle for privacy, the struggle against the misuse of private data and things like that, that's very, very important, but we shouldn't kind of um, fantasize how we will be, I don't know what uh, by the, 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 no, we should share and, and, and share more deliberately for the good cause so that we can help the human and things like that. So like these things should get into some kind of balance without only the dark fantasy, how surveillance, you know, is actually good for capital, like for, for making money. I'm, I'm, I'm also not sure about that directly, but letting them do all of that, that's bad. And that's what makes their business uh, good, but I think that Google, Facebook, they would be just fine without surveilling that much because they have a quite good positions in uh, in the network for that. Uh, yeah. Great. Thanks, Marcel. Um, we have come to the end. I'm I'm very sorry. There are still many uh, questions open. Um, we will try to answer these questions in writing and post them on the OS5 website. Um, I would like to thank all our uh, presenters uh, today. Uh, Balaj, Martin Paul, Eve, Arul, uh, 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 Marcel, and Virginia. Thank you so much for your contributions today. We have, I really feel that we have only just opened up uh, the subject and enlarged it way beyond the purview that I had initially imagined. Um, unfortunately, this is what happens always in these webinars. Um, I would like to thank everybody who attended this. Uh, I hope that you found it a thought-provoking uh, encounter uh, concerning uh, shadow libraries and their relationship to the broader publishing and political landscape um, and legal landscape. And uh, we uh, from OSPA definitely would love to see you again in one of our other webinars that I'm sure you'll find announcement for or all over the web. Um, and with that, uh, I wish you a wonderful rest of the day or night, wherever you are. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you again to all of our panelists. And just a reminder, speakers, that you are still live. We will keep the webinar open for a few minutes to allow participants to take the resources. And again, participants, if you haven't been able to take the resources, we will share those along with the recording, the slides, and any further questions that came through later on. Um, so thank you again for joining us. And once again, a big thanks to our sponsors who help us to make these webinars available to everyone. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all. Um, I think that what usually happens is that we send the remaining questions around by, uh, by email in a, in a Google Doc. Um, I wanted to get to Dave's question because it's this nice boom uh, final question, but <laughs> there was no more time. Um, yeah, I really, uh, I really appreciated this this exchange. I think that it was quite quite stimulating. Yeah. So, um, thanks for yes. organizing this. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Vincent. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, feel free to hang out. I think we're still live. Uh, Ruby will tell me when when we're off. Uh, but if you have other things to do, then uh, hope to see you at some point in person or digitally. Thank you, Vincent. Yes, I think we'll pause the recording now and we will, yes, we will allow participants to leave the session. Thank you very much once again. The recording has stopped.